if I can get people tuned in to what is their why, now I have a reason to want to work on my diet. Now I have a reason to want to improve my sleep, to exercise. If I don't have a why, then I send them to a talk therapist so they can help figure out a why. Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Thrive State Podcast. Welcome in and happy new year. Happy 2024. So glad that you guys have chosen the Thrive State Podcast to be one of your go-tos for health, happiness, human potential. I'm Dr. V, your host, triple board certified MD and performance and longevity expert. Now, before we dive into the podcast, I want to let you know about a very special event free event called the Thrive State Summit. This is a place where I interview 50 of the world's thought leaders in mental and emotional wellness, giving you the tools to really take your 2024, your mental health, your emotions, your finances, your happiness to the next level. You're going to get it completely free. It launches on February 1st. You could sign up and register at thrivestatesummit.com. If this is the first time you've joined this podcast, welcome. This is a new and exciting place for you in 2024. And I want to leave everybody with some free resources for their health, longevity, and peak performance. You can get all of that at thrivestatestarter.com. There you'll find lecture notes for keynotes I've done with Fortune 500 companies all over the world. You'll find breathwork exercises to bring you into states of calm, of joy, of gratitude, and a whole bunch of Thrive State resources so that you can take yourself, your family, your loved ones, your organizations to the next level as well. And please, if this podcast has given you value, if you've taken a nugget or nuggets from this podcast to improve on your life, please do us a favor. Allow this podcast to grow by sharing this podcast with your friends and family members and leaving us a five-star review wherever podcasts are heard. This will really help bring this podcast to more listeners, more people, and to heal the world collectively. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to today's podcast where our guest is returning for a second time, only because I've been so impressed about her insights on health and nutrition. It is my honor to introduce to you a very truly inspirational figure in the world of medicine and wellness, Dr. Terry Walls. She actually carved a very unique path in her career, blending both her personal experiences with professional expertise. Now, she's not only a respected clinical professor of medicine, but also a beacon of hope for many experiencing chronic diseases. Her journey actually took a pivotal turn in 2000 when she was diagnosed with relapsing remitting multiple sclerosis, a challenge that deeply influences her career and life trajectory. Now, what makes her story extraordinary is not just her battle with MS, but how she confronted with the possibility of being wheelchair bound. Dr. Walls took a bold step towards self-healing. She developed the Walls Protocol, a modified paleo diet emphasizing grass-fed meat, fish, leafy vegetables, roots, nuts, and fruits, while restricting things such as dairy, grains, legumes, and sugars. And this revolutionary approach not only alleviated her symptoms, but transformed her life, allowing her to shift from dependency on a wheelchair to actively pedaling her bike to work. Now, beyond her personal triumph, Dr. Walls is a vanguard in clinical research, focusing on the impact of diet and lifestyle on chronic diseases, especially multiple sclerosis and amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, or ALS. Her work is not just about clinical trials, it's about changing lives, as evidenced by her receiving the Institute of Functional Medicine's Linus Pauling Award in 2018 for her remarkable contributions in research, clinical care, and patient advocacy. You'll find out more about her clinical studies on this podcast, but if you, a friend, or family member have multiple sclerosis, Dr. Walls is actually actively enrolling people in a clinical study studying the effects on diet and on the outcomes of multiple sclerosis. This is something that is completely paid for, and you get to work directly with Dr. Walls and her team. Please visit her website for more information. Now, today she joins us 
with her insights, experiences, and her profound knowledge that she's gained to blend modern medicine with ancestral health principles. So buckle up and enjoy this enlightening conversation with Dr. Terry Walls. Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Thrive State Podcast. I very rarely have guests for the second time on the podcast, but when you have somebody that just has so many additional information to share with our audience, we have to invite them back. So Dr. Terry Walls, welcome back to the Thrive State Podcast. Hey, thanks for having me. I love what you do as well. Well, I can't wait to dive into this. And there is a portion of our podcast, as you may remember, where it's a game show style. Five quick questions, whatever comes up into my mind. And I already have the first question that I do have. The five to okay. five. And if you win this, of course, you win a second meal, healthy meal, on me the next time we meet at a conference or something like that. So my question to you now is, are you ready to play the five to thrive? Oh, I love playing this game. So let's go. Here we go. Question number one is, why is your tongue blue? Oh, methylene blue. I've been uh, trying out methylene blue as a biohacking. I'll, let me show it to everyone. <laughs> Very blue. That's, that's like your shirt blue. And you know what? I got started doing this because my dog has been ill. And so people suggested that I give him methylene blue. Like, okay, so uh, that I started giving it to him. It's been helping him out. Well, I'll, I guess I'll try that as well. 1,000 points for that answer. Question number two is, of all the different type of biohacks and potential practices what we have for self-care, what have you found that has been most resonant with you? Paying more attention to sleep. Sleep's been very difficult all of my life, and so I have to really pay attention to winding down and meditating, getting ready uh, to have good sleep. Excellent. Question number three is, was there a book, a belief, a concept that you had growing up that made you just go, wow, that has really changed how I perceive the world and led you to you know, pivot in life at that point? I'm going to give you two books. Uh, one that I had as a teenager, Yule Gibbon, Stalking the Wild Asparagus. I grew up on a farm. I loved exploring our more wild uh, places and foraging and bringing home a variety of foods and feeding my family that. And I've continued to really enjoy being in the wild and foraging. The other book that was very impactful, and I read that during uh, my medical training or shortly after medical training, and that had to do with Man's Search for Meaning by yes. uh, Viktor Frankl. Because we all are going to experience loss and suffering unless we die unexpectedly very young. And his book really helped me think differently about loss and meaning and how we respond to that. Yeah. So I think it's one of the most important lessons that I talk about when I teach clinicians and when I teach the public. Yeah, his quote there between stimulus and response, there's a space, is one one thing that I teach other people as well because either we're making unconscious choices from a place of old programming that leads us to to have choices in our life that that's creating chronic symptoms and chronic disease, or can we show up differently and make some conscious choices about how we choose to respond because that ultimately changes up the energetics and the messages that we give to our DNA. You know, absolutely. And for those who have children or grandchildren in their lives, I think it could be so helpful to realize that, yes, those young people will grow up and they're going to face really difficult loss. And so, and they may not listen to what we say, but they're certainly going to watch what we do. Yeah. And so if we can be mindful that I want to model for my kids the choices and resilience I want them to have when they have their difficult times. That's beautiful. All right. 3,000 points thus far. Question number four is if you could have a superpower, what would that be? To be still in my mind. Mm. It, it can be very hard. I have so many ideas that I want to be doing, what the next experiments that I want to run, the next courses I want to create for the public that I have to really work at no, I need some quiet time here. Beautiful. And the last question is, how would you like to be remembered? Well, you know, I have this big, hairy, audacious goal of changing the standard of care for people with MS and neuroimmune conditions, such that, yep, maybe we're going to be told that we have potent disease-modifying drugs, but just as important is addressing diet and lifestyle. 
I, and I want that to be my legacy, that that will become the standard of care that everyone will be told, yep, we may or may not have FDA-approved drugs, but just as important, we'll be addressing diet and lifestyle. And I may not have the expertise to do that because I'm so busy doing the DMT's things, but I'll get you to the people who can help you. Excellent. Beautiful. Hey, 5,000 points, which means I have two meals I have to deliver to you. And I'm really excited to kind of dive into what meal you would choose because we'll go in a little bit more specifically on the different diets that are out there that I know is so confusing for so many people. But before we do that, I just wanted to take a quick moment to reflect, you know, to have people who don't know you. And I do recommend you going back to our first podcast to hear your story. But, you know, you had MS. I myself, you know, as an interventional radiologist seven years ago, was overweight, diabetic, had high blood pressure and on prescription medications. And it was diet and lifestyle that switched that around. So can you share a little bit of that story and basically how you have become such a champion for diet and lifestyle of, from living that life? You know, I'm going to dial it back even further. So I'm a farm kid, very active, very strong. Uh, um, you're athletic, throwing bales around uh, right. and doing the, uh, lots of manual labor. But in retrospect, I realized I had a lot of prodrome symptoms. I had, you know, really painful periods, uh, heavy bleeding, uh, clots. I had some asthma. I had migraines that were uh, really quite intense. And I go off to medical school, and you know, I, I start having more trouble with electrical uh, pains in my face that would eventually be diagnosed as trigeminal neuralgia. After medical school. I decided I wanted to have children, and I wasn't getting pregnant. I finally, in the workup, we discovered I had endometriosis. I, and you know, that's um, we now know uh, it has many autoimmune features. I went through IVF and had my kids. We also know, and I didn't acknowledge that, I've struggled with depression. I began to have trouble with depression as soon as I was an adolescent. And I realized if I worked out really hard and I started running, I could have a much better mood. So we also now know that people with MS, there are prodrome conditions that you have that increase the risk. And those, those conditions are migraines, anxiety, depression, skin issues, and I, and I do have a, some mild psoriasis, pelvic pain, endometriosis, infertility. I, like many people with MS, had had my prodrome for 10 to 15 years before I had my first neurologic symptom, and then another 10 years later, then I'd get a VMS diagnosis. I, and that is super, super common, that people with an autoimmune or a neuroimmune condition have these programs where if we would know to be alert, to get people fired up about these radical things known as diet and lifestyle, we could reverse the program and never have to have MS. That's what I want all of your listeners to know is, do you have any of those prodrome issues, anxiety, depression, skin issues, asthma, pelvic pain, endometriosis? You're at much greater risk for developing MS. And if we could get you fired up about the things that Ken and Vu teaches and I teach, we can prevent so much trouble. That is such a beautiful and hopeful and empowering thing for, for people to know. And I know one of the things that, you know, is still a hot topic and many people debate over this is diet. You know, we understand that the Walls protocol and, and, you know, our conversation the first time around as the type of diet people can get, you know, particularly when they have autoimmune system, not necessarily MS, but, but these symptoms, I find that the Walls protocol is a general protocol for people with any chronic symptoms or disease to actually improve with. But yet we hear of keto, we hear of paleo, we hear of carnivore diets. How do they all kind of play together? And how does somebody without a medical background begin to start to access what diet might be best for them? You know, I, I like to think about this from a ancestral health perspective. Yes. And if we think about our heritage, we're with the primates. We separated about 7 million years ago. And our genus Homo, 2.5 million. Our species, Homo sapiens, 250,000. 
And at that point, we're still eating a lot of greens, a few tubers, a lot of dirt, and increasingly a number of animal products. Shellfish, fish, insects, small mammals. And we, about 100,000 years ago, figure out fire. And we start cooking our food, our guts shorten a bit. And we also at the same time begin fermenting food. And we migrate out of Africa up to Europe. Now, I meet the Neanderthals, have a war f- uh, for about 100,000 years. And you know we finally assimilate the Neanderthals. What I want everyone to know is there are many, many dietary patterns. I hope you're enjoying the podcast thus far. Now, I wanted to give you a really neat resource that I've been working on for the past year. Are you living with chronic stress, burnout, or the nagging symptoms of anxiety and depression? Do you find yourself battling fatigue or brain fog or feeling like you're not performing at your best? Well, what I've been working on all of this year is made especially for you. It is an online virtual event called the Thrive State Summit. You can register now for free at thrivestatesummit.com. But what it is, is this. You get to connect with and learn from 50 world-renowned thought leaders, experts, and some of your favorite celebrities. We've got people like Bruce Lipton, Vishen Lakhiati, Dave Asprey, Dr. Josh Axe, all united with a shared mission to tackle the mental health crisis that is impacting each and every one of us. Now, the Thrive State Summit isn't just another event. It is really my hope that it becomes a catalyst for change, particularly in this fast-paced world. And so what can you expect? You could expect to take home life-changing takeaways from all our experts, activation sessions to be able to bring you into states of calm and relaxation, really all the resources for you to become the best version of yourself. And finally, proceeds from the Thrive State Summit will go to four mental health nonprofits, improving Rare Impact Fund, the Trevor Project, Good Days, Genius Recoveries. So please if you invest in yourself and please share this resource with your friends and family members. It's something I poured my entire heart into this past year, and I know it's going to help so many people. So register now at thrivestatesummit.com. We've had reproductive success in many ecosystems, in deserts, in savannas, grasslands, uh, in forest, in the tropics, subtropics, temperate zones, and the Arctic. So if anyone says, I have the one correct diet, stop following them. There are many diets that are helpful. We, we also know from our research, and there are many studies that show us, the more westernized our diet, the worse the health outcomes. So the more added sugar, the more processed foods, particularly the what I call the ultra-processed foods, these are the flour-based products, breads, pastas, cereals. The more servings of that we have, the worse the health outcomes. And at least here in the U.S., the average vegetable intake is one and a half servings a day. Otherwise, we're eating so much processed foods, flour-based pastries, cereals, breads. That's terrible for us. And if we look at you know the standard westernized diet, it's about 250 to 350 grams of carbohydrate. Most of it, you know, that ultra-processed flour-based foods. A Mediterranean diet would be about 125 grams. A traditional diet from the hunter-gatherers from around the world range from carnivore, animal products, no plants, to a mix of animal products and plants. So from basically no carbs up to about 100 grams of carbs, with the average being probably 75 or less. So what I try to tell my followers is there are many diets that you can choose from. And we can have a debate over which diets have the best research, but the diet research is still pretty young, so that we're, we're gonna, there's a lot more to learn. But I want you to do this as a family. And so however we can improve your diet as a family, and it may be helpful to begin to talk about, well, what foods could I reduce or eliminate? What foods could I increase? And I hope people have heard me say added sugars and flour-based processed foods are really a problem. So eliminate or reduce those. And then add more protein, add more non-starchy vegetables, more berries, healthy fats. And if you do that as a Mediterranean or a paleo or a keto or a carnivore, and you find someone who can help you with a more traditional diet, I predict your health will improve. And depending, if you saw me as your physician, 
I would look at your comorbid issues. I'd look at you and your family. And I might talk with you and say, okay, based on all of your medical issues, I think the this diet or these dietary plans would be the best. These self-care routines would be very helpful. And then I um, like to ask, so what did you learn? And what are you going to do? Mm. Uh, so it gives me feedback that I'm an effective teacher or not. And I have to use simpler language. And that the person's ready for a big, complicated plan. Or they're not. And they need a small, achievable next step. Because some people are ready to do a whole lot. And some need to make a small next step. Yeah, that is uh, great to know. And, and, and definitely just shows how personalized medicine could get. Because if you're not reaching people, if, 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 if people are not ready to do a whole revamp and you give up on them because they're not ready to do that, then it's hard for them to make that map, right? And if you do this as a family, we can make it work. Now, this doesn't mean that if I tell my patient that I, I'm really convinced they have gluten sensitivity, so I want them to at least go gluten-free, that the whole family needs to be gluten-free meticulously. But then we have a conversation like, okay, spouse... If you want to have your pizza and beer, can we work out a plan so you get to have your pizza and beer away from the patient so they don't have to watch and smell? Because, you know, if we're hungry, we love that food, it tastes good, they're going to succumb to making a choice that they would prefer to not make. But it'd be so much easier if they agree that on Friday, the spouse goes out with his or her friends to have the food that they don't eat at home anymore. And the patient has a different set of friends come in to have a perfectly allowable meal. So you want to have everyone enjoy the food that is important to them. But you want to do it in a way that is supportive for the patient. Yeah. I want to dive a little bit deeper into the keto diet. Can you discuss, are there any sort of ancestral origins to the keto diet? Yeah. I, I guess from there... Well, one, can you mention what the keto diet is and then, you know, ancestral origins? And I'll, I'll, I'll go deeper in terms of how we have back the conversation. So the keto diet is based, uh, it is usually an animal products based diet, uh, higher in meat. It's going to be higher in fats and very, very low in carbs, probably under 30 grams. If you're using medium chain triglycerides, you might be able to get up to 50 grams. You should be able to have blood ketones above 0.5 millimoles, and it may be as high as 2 or 3 millimoles. It changes how your brain runs the chemistry of life. Uh, the brain can use ketones really very well. It's a very efficient fuel uh, in the brain. And for people with cognitive decline or seizure or severe mental health issues, ketogenic diets can be profoundly helpful. We know that there are a number of societies that are ketogenic year-round or mu much of the year-round. People in the Arctic, for example, there aren't that many carbohydrates for them to consume much of the year, so they are using animal products uh, in a high-fat diet year-round. There are societies in Africa that consume milk, blood, meat, eggs, and very few uh, carbohydrates. There are societies, I believe, uh, the Mongols, Likewise, that are very animal products heavy. If we look at, again, the hunter-gatherers, they have a mix of plants, roots, very seasonally, leaves. So a lot of fibrous material, a lot of fiber, fair amount of dirt. But the total carbs, probably 30 grams, 50 grams, maybe as high as 80 grams, almost certainly under 100 grams, and much higher in protein. When we domesticated grain, yeah. when we domesticated legumes and dairy, but particularly grain and, le and uh, legumes, we added a more consistent amount of calories and we added a lot more carbohydrates. And then when we created the industrial age and learned how to make white sugar and white flour and shelf-stable food, we really increased the carbohydrates in our diet. And we've been steadily increasing the carbohydrates over the last... Well, since the last 300 years, but dramatically in the last 50 years. Yeah. So, you know, people look at keto as being such a deviation from how we normally eat, but it's really seems to be more ancestral and traditional in our approach. Correct. 
you know, and our ancestors were in ketosis because they had to work really hard to get their food. If you do more than two hours of physical activity, you're in ketosis because you've burned off all of your stored glycogen and you're in ketosis on that basis. You have a successful hunt, you have successful forage, you bring back the food, you have plentiful food, higher in protein, and depending on your gathering, you might have had more tubers and carbs, you might have had honey, you might have had berries. And so you have a refed state, mm -hmm. you're resting, enjoying life, you're out of food, and it all starts again. You're back in ketosis because you don't have much food and you're working really hard to get the food. Yeah, it seems like when people also talk about intermittent fasting, they think, oh, wow, this is a deviation of what we normally do. But as I explained, every li living species, unicellular or multicellular, life has been able to adapt to times when there is no nutrients around. And a way they've been able to do so is recycle what they have in a process of rejuvenation that is actually healthy for them. And so not eating all the time is actually something that our ancestors had to be able to do out of necessity. And our ability to now have a plethora of food abundance around us is not allowing us to maybe tap into some of the machineries that are, you know, offering rejuvenation and autophagy. Yeah. You know, I'll throw out a, another concept here. We created heating and cooling. So we now live between 68 and 72 degrees. I hope you're enjoying the podcast so far. If you are, I just wanted to let you know, join our community. There's so many free resources and a great community of people that desire health, happiness, human potential to have more in their life, more health, more energy. And when you have those two things together, you could create more happiness, more abundance, whether it be financial, uh, romantic, all these things in your life. Um, and if you're just starting out, you don't know where to go, just sign up for thrivestatestarter.com because in there, you're going to get a bundle of information that includes a longevity ebook, a longevity and performance resource guide, lecture notes, that come from my keynotes at Google, at Fortune 500 companies, uh, all the insights in that keynote in lecture slide form given to you. And then finally, breathwork. I share three powerful breathwork exercises to access calm, which really gives you clarity and peace during the day, to access energy if you need to wake up and, and really motivate yourself. And finally, a breathwork routine that you could do every single morning so that you could be very intentional with how you create that day. You could find all this stuff delivered free to your inbox at thrivestatestarter.com. And our community is growing. If you want to be a part of a community of people that desire the Thrive State, that are really in Thrive State themselves and, and help other people along with that, you could be a part of the community. You can get group coaching from me. We do breathwork sessions, meditation sessions, and you also get to drop in and participate in podcasts in the future. You could find more about the community at mythrivestate.com. That's M-Y-T-H-R-I-V-E-S-T-A-T-E.com. So check out those resources. You're not going to be disappointed. And please enjoy the remainder of this podcast. And we put our metabolism at rest. We are intolerant to hot weather and intolerant to cold weather. That's like putting ourselves at bed rest. I think there's a tremendous amount of harm with living and working in this very narrow temperature range. That is, that's something I think people should consider. So, you know, intermittent fasting or time-restricted eating, ketogenic diets seem to be a little bit more ancestral. So is it safe to say that we can conclude that these industrialized ways of eating and the carbohydrates and sugars that are we are adding is a bulk of the cause of some of these chronic diseases that we're starting to see crop up more often? Well, not the answer, but just increase the incidence all around. I, I think it's certainly a risk factor. Yeah. Certainly a risk factor. And so I talked with my clinicians and with my patients Increase the protein, increase the non starchy vegetables. And then we can decide, do we want to do a more ketogenic diet or not? 
in depending on the clinical circumstances, I may really prefer a ketogenic diet. I think a paleo diet is easier. And for some folks, that's too hard. They would much rather do a Mediterranean diet. And I'm like, you know what? If that's what you and your family can do, that's fine. Let's let's start there. Yeah. As we're talking about diets now, what have you seen out in the literature in terms of how the ketogenic diet seems to be improving all these symptoms? And I understand you also have a clinical trial of yeah. diets and its clinical outcomes. Can you talk about that? What we're seeing is that it shifts the metabolic pathways in the brain. So instead of relying on glucose, we're relying on the ketone pathways. And that makes it more difficult to have seizures. It improves mood regulation. It improves mental clarity. It reduces oxidative stress. So in the brain, being in ketosis, super helpful. And if you have insulin resistance, being in ketosis, super helpful. It improves insulin sensitivity improves blood sugar control. Again, very, very helpful. We do have a single arm study uh, that uh, Nick Brenton did where he had a cohort of 65 folks with, um, put them on a modified Atkins diet, I believe about 35 grams of carbs, and followed them for six months and found that people could tolerate the diet, that they had better, less anxiety, less depression, less fatigue, higher quality of life, and that there are no serious adverse outcomes. Now, because there's not a control group, that's still you know not as strong of evidence. We've had some very small ketogenic diet studies that show, again, similar results, better mood, better quality of life. What we're doing, and we're very excited about this, is we're comparing a paleo diet, which does have some really very nice results behind it, to a tight restrictive olive oil based ketogenic diet, two usual diet. We'll follow people for two years. They'll come in here to the University of Iowa, we'll get baseline assessments, then randomize them to the paleo diet, the keto diet, or usual diet, bring them back in three months for repeat assessments and blood work, and bring them back at 24 months. We will look at quality of life, look at fatigue, mood. We'll look at walking hand, vision, and we'll look at brain structure as measured by MRIs. So we'll build, and I think a really inter interesting question is, can we get people to healthy rates of brain volume loss by either of these diets? Because as a group, people with MS losing our brain volume 1% or more per year, which is why we have more anxiety, more depression, more frailty. If you have healthy aging, it's 0.3% or less per year. And I'm very hopeful that we can see that. Oh, that's brilliant. And so this is these are for MS patients only at this point? Correct. So uh, people with relapsing or remitting MS who are willing to be randomized. So if you're doing a therapeutic diet now, and, and because more and more people with MS are like, you know what, I got a bad disease, I'm doing a therapeutic diet. As long as you're willing to be randomized so that if you're randomized to keto, you're like, okay, I'm going to do keto. If you're randomized to paleo, okay, I'm going to do paleo. If you're in the usual diet, you get to pick whatever dietary patterns that are speaking to you. We have people who are coming to us who have done our previous studies and we're on a low-fat diet that's done well with it. And they're like, we want to do another one. It's okay. You just have to be willing. This, yep, they were, they were willing. So that's we find that very exciting that people will keep coming back to re-up and be part of another study with us. Oh, that's great. Now, just for the audience, how do you distinguish between the keto and the paleo? Would you find that the keto is just more, you know, fat content heavy and, and probably a little so, restricted with carbohydrates in the paleo? So the keto group is will have between 80 and 100 grams of carbs. Oh, okay. The paleo group is going to have between 30 and 40 grams of carbs. So the keto group is not really having any, uh, any fruit. They'll have just a, a very tiny amount of berries. And they'll, so we'll still encourage them to have a lot of greens, sauerkraut. The paleo group will be talking about yams and squashes, berries. And so and some of those folks may get even up to 100 grams of carbs. Okay. Well, very good. What would be, you know, based on what you know out there, what are your expectations of the results that you have? Well, uh, one of th some of the things that we, we know is p 
people in the usual diet room group are going to improve their diet. They're not going to be eating the standard American diet. So I'm confident that all three groups will improve. Plus, we're also giving people in the usual diet arm tips on how to improve their diet. So they will, I'm sure, improve their diet. I'm still hopeful that we'll be able to see a difference between the intervention arms and the control arm. I have no idea which will be better, the keto or the paleo. There are reasons to think that keto may be better. But the research that's been out there thus far has a much stronger effect size on uh, the paleo diet. So it's going to be super interesting. And we, we are freezing salivary samples so we can do microbiome. We are freezing PAX genes, so be able to look at change in gene expression at the end. And we're uh, freezing blood so we can look at change in metabolome at the end. Now, I should qualify that I'll have to raise more money to do the PAX gene and the metabolome. So we're, we're taking all of our money to just do the study. We're enrolling 156 people. We've got, you know, 120 in and randomized. So that's still, you know, 36 more to get in. But I'm hoping that you can help me find those 36 and that everyone who's listening, you'll share the assets that we have. You know, it's terrywalls.com forward slash MS study. We'll be sure that you have the QRS code that people could share on the social media so that people could complete this survey screens to see if you're eligible and help us get uh, those last uh, 30 people. This is really great. And for, you know, anyone with MS or know anybody for MS, really you're enrolling and saying yes to something that is going to improve your life no matter what you get randomized to. Uh, not only that, but over the course of two years, you're going to get detailed information of so many biomarkers that it is uh, something that's going to be, you know, great tool for you to understand yourself. It'll be super helpful because the intervention arms get a lot of support. The control arm still gets a monthly message from me and my team that we've recorded tips on how to improve your diet. So again, everyone is being supported. Everyone, we anticipate all three groups will improve and it will help us show how big a difference keto can be, how big a difference paleo can be, and how much can we help people with messages every month on how to improve their diet. Oh, that's beautiful. Please check it out. It is terrywalls.com slash MS study. Last question I have for you, Dr. Walls, is one that I've asked you before. We'll see if it's different, but I'm going to add an add additional question. Is everything that you've thus far seen in life, what has been your best medicine? And if you had to prescribe a medicine that you can see for the world, what would that be? Understand meaning. What is your why? It has been most profound for me to know what is my why? Why am I willing to do the work of self-care to be improving my circumstances? And it's the most important question I ask all of my patients. What is your why? A great way to get to this is if I'm looking across the street, I see smoke rolling out of the windows. Is there someone or something that I care so deeply about that I would run into that house, even barefoot over broken glass, to go save. And, you know, for many, it's my children, my grandchildren, my spouse. It might be my dog, my cat. And if I can get people tuned in to what is their why, now I have a reason to want to work on my diet. Now I have a reason to want to improve my sleep, to exercise. If I don't have a why, then I send them to a talk therapist so they can help figure out a why. So they could have some meaning and joy in their life. Oh, beautiful. Dr. Walls, thank you so much for the work that you do and for the work that you're continuing to do for us to be able to understand ourselves better and in giving us the tools to address the chronic disease epidemic that we have. Thank you so much again for your work and thank you for being on the Thrive State Podcast. Thank you. I hope you enjoy that episode of the Thrive State Podcast. And if you're finding that this content is really helping you and your family members, please consider supporting our mission and our cause of elevating health, happiness, and human potential for people all over the world. You can do so by making sure that you subscribe to this podcast, sharing it with your friends and family members, and leaving us a five-star review wherever podcasts are heard. 
all these things are gonna really help elevate the show and to give us the resources to continue to bring more content just like this to yourself as well as the people that you love. If you haven't already, you might want to consider joining our community. We actually have a community where people get to engage with me in group sessions, where we do breath work, meditation, where we do challenges together, really to be able to get us access to health, happiness, human potential, so that we could have longevity and performance in our life as well. You could check out our community at mythrivestate.com. That's M-Y-T-H-R-I-B-E. S-T-A-T-E dot com. And if you haven't already, pick up a copy of my book, Thrive State. It really gives you all the tools, the pillars that you need to create a blueprint to control the energetics of your life. Who are you? How you show up in the world? The choices that you consistently make create an energy in your body and you can control this. And when you can control that, you also control the messages you give to your DNA that gives you access again to optimal health, longevity and peak performance and let me also just share a free gift to you if you haven't already please pick up my longevity and performance bundle where i share lecture notes ebooks breathwork exercises and longevity and performance resources at thrivestatestarter.com thank you so much for being a part of this community thank you for helping us grow Remember always, my friends, that you are your best medicine.